Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff hope you enjoy it please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy awesome and we're live folks thank you very much for joining uh, joining me on the podcast today it's a pleasure to be joined by professor Naveed Sattar who's uh, a professor of metabolic medicine at the University of Glasgow and an expert in prevention and management of diabetes obesity and heart disease um, and he's recently contributed to Public Health England report on COVID-19 and obesity. So he's not doing a huge amount by the sounds of things. Um, Naveed, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks, Lewis. No, pleasure to be here. You sound, you sound busy. Um, yeah, it's been a busy uh, sort of few months. I think um, when COVID first hit, I thought my workload would go down. But if anything, it's gone up and partly because... Uh, COVID is affecting all of the disease areas that I'm sort of working on. So I've been uh, having lots of opportunities to engage in relevant research around COVID and risks, which is um, which is a good thing, and you know to try and contribute at this time. Yeah. yeah. And you've been specifically looking at obesity, or or actually no, we've been looking at more than that. So it started off we, um, you know. Because I know about risks, you know, I do lots of work on what's known as cardiovascular risks. So we're familiar with generating risk scores for diseases and different outcomes. Um, so, I, you know, I'm familiar with lots of risk factors. Um, so there's been other areas. So, for example, one of the first questions that came out of COVID was, is it a link to vitamin D? Yes. And, yeah. and as part as part of that, um, <laughs> I, you know, there's a fantastic data source that many researchers around the world are now using called the UK Biobank which I think probably you're familiar with, and some of the listeners may be, you know, half a million people uh, around about 2006 to 2008 had lots of measurements done and their disease outcomes have been followed up indefinitely thereafter. And yeah. so we quickly had a quick look at vitamin D levels in UK Biobank and then subsequent COVID outcomes when they manifested about 10 years later. And although we showed that vitamin D levels were lower in people who developed COVID, once you adjust for all the factors that also lead to vitamin D, there was no real clear association. So our work probably suggests that vitamin D is unlikely to be a strong risk factor for severe COVID, but it was preliminary. Having said that, the NICE guidelines updated used star data, which is kind of nice. Okay, interesting. And then I think there's still there's still more studies and research going on uh, into vitamin D, I believe. So we've... Oh, no, absolutely. So, um, you know, there's different levels of evidence, Lewis, as you're familiar with. You know, one of them is, for example, just what's known as an observational study where you have measurements and you look to outcomes. But because many things change together, so lots of risk factors can interact with each other, it's very hard to work at cause and effect from those type of studies. And then an ideal study, and I think we're familiar with this, is actually do a randomized trial. So yeah. I'm now aware that there are a couple of randomized trials, there may be more. Um, that have been set up to look at vitamin D to see whether it protects against COVID. And the way that researchers would do that would be, for example, take a population, give half of them a vitamin D tablet, the other half a placebo, but not who, no one knows who got, gets what because it's all blinded. Yeah. Uh, and then hopefully, you know, follow these people up. And if there's a second wave, um, look at people who develop COVID and severe COVID and then try and link it back to who got the vitamin D tablet versus the placebo. And yeah. if there is a link that those who got vitamin D tablets should have had lower risk of COVID and lower infections, and that's the way you do randomized trials. And that's yeah. by far the best evidence base that we have for all disease areas. And it, you know, this is really important in this particular scenario. And, and I think many listeners have been familiar with the use of randomized trials where they worked at dexamethasone, was a very good treatment for COVID. Um, yes. and that was you know, led out of Oxford, but included many hospital centres and centres around the UK, and it was big and it was definitive. And um, what's a, and what's a big trial? That's no, what's the kind a decent, of evidence that we really need to change the. What's what's a decent size trial that can be relied upon? Well, to, uh, 
the size of the trial really depends on how many outcomes you expect. Okay. So, for right. example, the power of a trial is not so much. So, you know, if we did a trial in a million people, say a million a million teenagers, we only expected five people to develop the outcome. That's not powerful enough. Right. So okay. the trial's power is, is dependent on the number of people who develop an outcome. So, again, uh, as an example, is if we did, it's like the vaccination trials that are going on at the moment. So, yeah. well, you know, out of Oxford and other places, at the moment, you know, they originally planned to do them in the UK, but as the number of infections have gone down in the UK, they would have to do it forever to really get an answer unless we get a second wave. So what they've done is diversified and they've gone out to Brazil and the US. Right. Where many more people are getting infections to get the power. So power of any trial depends on the number of outcomes you expect. Right. Interesting. And with the vaccines, obviously, here you're you're injecting healthy people. So, I mean, presumably you've got to be very, very certain that there's not going to be any uh, any adverse effects from, from this. Well, yeah, so um, you're completely correct, Lewis. So the, the benefits of a trial are twofold. One is to know that does the intervention actually do what it, it hopes to, you know, says on the tin? Does it actually give you benefit? And the second question is, is there any evidence of harm? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, the placebo or the in the vaccine trials, not necessarily a placebo, I think it's a vaccine against meningitis that they're using, which they know is safe. Right, okay. Um, oh, okay. So, um, yeah. so they're trying and to refashion, have... like refashion a, a, an old drug to use for, for COVID rather than a novel. No, no, no. So, so, the, so the comparator is the meningitis. Ah, is, okay. Right. Because it's not safe. And the reason they, they're doing that is because it, it, it may mask that, you know, some people sometimes know that they get an early... Um, they've got the sort of the proper vaccine as if they develop some kind of symptoms, but my guess is with the you know with a with another active comparator meningitis, although who, no one knows who gets what, they might the early symptoms are the same, so they can't work out. Oh, I definitely got the vaccine because I feel a bit fluey the next day. Right, right, yeah, yeah. So normally a placebo is, is either a dummy tablet with nothing in it, as, a, as if it's a tablet, or um, you know, but in in the vaccine world. It, you know, they obviously have to have a uh, another comparator which is relatively safe and doesn't cause harm and might mask the fact that some people are getting um, a true vaccine versus not. So the way you actually blind a trial is very important um, yeah. in, in the sense that the person who gets it can't guess what they've, got, they've been given. The doctors can't guess what they've been given. Um, even though you know the coding and you only break that code at the end of the trial, once you've collected enough people who've had the outcome to give you the power for the trial. Interesting. It's great. That's I mean, I mean, it's interesting because COVID, I mean, obviously not a great thing to happen to the world, but it's, it sounds like that the scientific community has really, really got, I don't know whether it's better, faster. I don't know what it is, but there seems to be some amazing things going on. Um, you know, I've heard also like vaccines usually take like 10 years, 10 years or so to, to produce. And here we're looking at, a couple of years, maybe. I mean, well, I mean, the. I think that we're looking at even faster than that, Lewis, if it comes off. I mean, so the you know our colleagues from Oxford who are are you know I think it's a Professor Gilbert who's leading this is is very cautious in the way she says this. Uh, now they they had a lot of experience from previous um, you know SARS and Mar and, and you know um, types of um, diseases. And I think based on that experience, they were able to quickly develop a vaccine, which they thought might work using new technology. Um, but they've already gone past the first phase and they published in the Lancet that their vaccine uh, in, in the kind of early phase trial was shown to produce antibodies against um, you know, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. So they've got early indication that their, their drug might be beneficial. And with that kind of evidence and that it was safe, They've now gone on to do the bigger trial. I think I heard um, Dr. G Professor Gilbert on the on the TV. We were, you know, last night there was a there was a nice show on Channel Four, and um, she she was a you know she was a bit cagey because I don't think she wants to promise that it's definitely going to work. Yeah, um, yeah. she was also a bit cagey on the timing because and the, really the timing of the outcome depends on how many people get the virus. So yes, that's true. So that's yeah. a bit uncertain. Um, so it could be, a, my gut feeling is it could be as early as, uh, you know, a 
October, November, December, but I do think she said that. She said, let's just wait and see. <laughs> Interesting. I, I heard, um, I watched a great video. There's um, the CEO of Novartis. I'm sure you know, there's a guy called Vistant Nara Sim Simhan. Um, yeah. Sorry if I pronounced the surname wrong. Um, great guy and he does some great content on on linkedin he shares videos and his thoughts and, and stuff so for those that don't know it's really worth watching uh, and he was talking about vaccines and uh, you know i think that's that's his uh, his his background and he said you know 10 years usually to make a vaccine right because you need to make sure that it's not going to have adverse effects you don't want the the population losing faith in vaccines um which yeah. is a critical thing and he felt earliest we'd have something end of 2021 wow, which, okay. I thought was, which i thought was interesting but then you hear different things from different people and you know again and you hear different things coming out of different companies and different universities and you're not sure whether it's pr yeah. or you know it's quite interesting stuff well no i think and it's very interesting stuff and i think one is because there's no 100 percent guarantee that it's going to work uh, number two is even if it does work um, maybe there'll be some degree of harm. And that doesn't mean to say it won't necessarily be useful. It may be that, um, you know, they've got to then work out who do we give it to? Maybe we give it to the people at the very highest risk where the benefits outweigh the potential harms. Yeah. Uh, and, and number three, I think in normal circumstances, um, they would want at least a few years of safety to make sure there's no latent harm, as it were. Yes. Um, yeah. But that's that's usually with diseases which are much less prevalent and much, you know, often, um, you know, there's defined reasons to, to give this. Here we're talking about a pandemic which is affecting the whole world and it's affecting the world in a huge number of ways, including the economies, so that they may be able to make, you know, I think, I think the goalposts have changed. So it yeah. may be that if a vaccine comes up as 90% beneficial, not 100%, yeah, uh, but it's ten percent harmful. They might still be able to give it to certain people um, at the highest risk, if that makes sense. So I think all these things have to be worked out as things go. Ideally, it's going to be a hundred percent successful yeah. and zero, you know, and and hundred percent safe. But I don't, I'm, I have no idea if that's going to be the case. And yeah. I don't think, I don't think any of the vaccine makers want to commit themselves to this either. They just, no. <laughs> yeah. What's the what's the tell me the the herd immunity? Herd immunity is an interesting one, and I mean. You know, they talked about it a, a, a lot at the beginning, um, but what what actually is it? And do you think I think we'll actually get there, or is this just a kind of phrase that whoever yeah, whoever no, it was came up with it? And no, no, no. I think it's a I think it's a real you know, I think it's you know I'm obviously not an immunologist or virologist, but from yeah. my my understanding, it, and and I think if you think about it from a simple uh, numbers game, it, it's really. If, if around about, I think it's something like 60 or 70% of the population have now developed, had had COVID-19 and then developed some degree of immunity, should it last in all of them at the same time? Yeah. Um, that, that means that those people are no longer able to get severe disease or perhaps even get, you know, um, and, and that means there's only a small proportion that you can mix with who could get it. Right. Okay. The chances of people getting it are far less yeah. who have not exposed exposed to the virus, and the chances of spreading it are far less because most people you would encounter have had it and are immune. Okay. So yeah. so after this, so if if there's a second peak or if ever the first peak ended, uh, who knows if the, the first peak even ended anyway? Um, but we'll, we'll we'll be at a certain level where so many people have had it. Was it 60, 70 percent of the population? That then it will start to, to naturally kind of manage itself. Well, it, it, yeah, exactly. The, the number of people who potentially could get and get severe disease would be substantially less. Therefore, our hospitals will not be overwhelmed and so on yeah. and so on. Now, the caveats, of course, are they don't quite know about how much immunity this virus is, you know, once you've had the virus that you're actually getting. Does it depend on how severe you get the virus? Um, does it depend on having, a, you know, sustainable antibodies, which is the kind of one usual measure. Uh, yeah. And what they have published so far is that people who've had the virus usually have antibodies detectable, but they, those antibodies are falling over time. Yeah, yeah. But but there may be a second level of, the, of, of protection, which is what's known as the memory in certain cells of the body called T-cells. T-cells, yeah. 
Yeah, and if that mem if that's sufficient to give you some degree of immunity, so you don't get severe disease anymore, then that might be enough. But we just don't know. So I think there's lots, you know, and that's the problem with this virus is there's far too many unknowns. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. I've I had a friend of mine um, got tested last week. Um, it was a swab test. She was going on holiday. Had the virus. Devastated. No no symptoms. Has been the most careful person I know. Probably hasn't been out. Then got another test uh, uh, a few days later, came back negative. And then you've had, you know, people that I've heard that have had the antibodies and then a month or two later, to, to your point, no antibodies detectable. So it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a strange one. Um, but I think, and, and this is one of the, hopefully for me, a silver lining to this is, is I it feels like now we're able to talk about physical health because, you know, before, Certainly in the workplace, you know, people talk about mental health a lot, but you yeah. can't really talk about people's physical health. You know, you couldn't go up to someone and say, hey, you know, you need to start thinking about, you know, losing weight or your diet and stuff like that. It just you just couldn't do it. Um, but I know the work you're doing and I, and I think people are starting to talk about it more. And your so the study that you participated in. So. So correct me if I'm wrong. So you were looking at specifically um, people who are overweight or have obesity, uh, and comparing them to people with a healthy weight, and whether they had an increased risk of of contracting COVID or getting COVID seriously with complications. It we did both actually. So again, okay. we used the same data source called UK Biobank, um, and and just for those that don't know, can you what is UK Biobank exactly? Okay, so UK Biobank is a study that uh, led by, uh, you know, one of our senior colleagues in the UK, Professor Rory Collins, uh, who's, um, who's, he's a, you know, he's a fantastic man and uh, has done lots of the statin trials, you know, and various other things. Um, so um, he, he um, the, in Oxford, they recruited around about, uh, well, just over half a million people around the UK they tried to do it in a representative way so that they captured, um, uh, and it was between 40 and 70. So people, and they didn't go for younger people because most people are going to develop adverse outcomes when they get older. So again, it's back to the same way that if you did, you know, if, you, if we if we recruited half a million people the age of 10 to 20, we would have to wait for a long time before right. they develop disease outcomes, and that, you know, it's just simply not going to happen. So 40 to 70. Um, and that's when you know often prevention and treatments and all these things happen around the UK um, included uh, lots of you know they tried to make it representative in terms of the ethnic mix so sufficient number of South Asians Afro Caribbeans Chinese that were represented in the UK now they didn't quite match what was represented in the UK so there's always a bias because okay. they, for, for every sort of around about 20 people who are offered to be in maybe only five percent took up so okay. there's a sl slight you know, there's a slightly healthy cohort bias. And then these people were invited in for a one day visit uh, into a, a laboratory where they had lots of tests done, questions asked, blood samples taken. Uh, they did some physical measurements, including their body mass, their weight, their height. Um, they did some things like grip strength where they measured how strong their, their grips were. Um, uh, and, you know, some of them also did fitness tests on bicycles. So they collected all of that, all of that data, did blood samples, including genetics, you know, enough to do genetics and everybody. And then they all gave permission that they could be followed up every year right. through their routine, routine NHS records and through, you know, anytime something happened to them that would be reported back to UK Biobank. So, Great. for example, say if you were in it, Lewis, um, yeah. I think you're, pretty, you're too young at the moment, but um, say, for example, just, you were. Just. Just, okay. <laughs> I, you know, if you were in it um, anonymously, we wouldn't know your name, but everything's anonymized, which is really important. Um, um, you would have given permission to use your data, including your vitamin D levels at the time that you got blood, your blood fitness, you know, sorry, your, your fitness levels and relating to your health outcomes for like forever on for the rest right. of your life. Now, people had the ability to withdraw permission, small numbers have, but the vast, vast majority kept that going. And because it's half a million people, and because lots of people are getting outcomes, you can see the power has now been substantial. Instead of a normal study, like for example, that we could run in Glasgow, might be two, three thousand people. Yeah. This is this is 
more than 100 times bigger. That means within three or four years, you, you have maybe not just one or 200 people developing heart attack, you have perhaps 1,000, 2,000 people developing heart attack. Over 10 years, 20,000 developing heart attack. That means that the power to look at risk factors in relation to outcomes is that much greater. And also diseases where there hasn't been enough power because the studies have never been big enough, you know, where the disease, you know, the outcomes are, more, are, are rarer, are able to be looked at, if that makes sense. Yeah. So the power is in the number of events. And because you've got half a million people, you get lots of outcomes within a short period. So that's what's Brilliant. happened. Brilliant. So you've used that data for your, your recent um, study? Yes, we have, and it's not just our group, but that data is available to any researcher around the world, would you believe, for a small okay. fee. Yeah, okay. so it's it's completely open. So if yeah. you've got a bright idea, you can look at that. So that's another beautiful thing about UK Biobank. And the funny thing about it, Lewis, was when, it, when the Biobank first released, lots of UK researchers were familiar with it and started using it. I think people around the world were scratching their head thinking, hmm, that's a fantastic resource that UK have got. <laughs> Wouldn't be great if we had that. And they didn't realize that they could apply for it as well. Exactly. Yeah. That penny has dropped, and that there's now several hundred, maybe thousand set, you know, groups around the world who've now got free access to that data and they are able to apply their brain power to look at important questions. Amazing. And, 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 yeah, so that's it's a fantastic resource. And 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 we and many several other groups have looked at that data in relation to COVID. Yeah. And that's going on, both using genetics and the risk factors in relation to can we discover what factors are related to getting COVID or dying from COVID um, and, and help the overall research agenda around the world to try and uncover who is at the greatest risk and also uncover are there clues about the genes of certain people who get more severe COVID or not. So those are the kind of things that are ongoing at the moment. Amazing. And what have you found then? Because there's been... I say anecdotal evidence. My wife been, has been working in intensive care with COVID patients. And so, you know, from what I hear, the majority of people in intensive care are overweight, obesity, diabetes. It, what, are the, what, are, what is the data saying? Is that matching with, with yeah, that? Yeah, no, it's, no, 100%. Uh, so I've spoken to several of my colleagues who work in ITU, and they said that pretty much, in, I think in one weekend, pretty much nearly every patient was overweight or obese. Um, right. And um, so I've you know, actually I've spoken to three or four colleagues in different hospitals around Glasgow, and the yeah. vast majority had an effect, you know, uh, you know, were overweight or obese. Now that's uh, and so what did the data show? Our data suggested that that that, that progressively increasing BMI was linked to high risk of having severe COVID and dying from COVID. Now the Public Health England report that you mentioned right at the beginning, Lewis, has collated yeah. lots of data, um, and. By and large, data that came from New York or from Italy or from France, uh, from big cohorts, from small cohorts, were broadly consistent. Those people who had higher body mass indexes and the level of obesity or severe obesity had higher risk from getting into ITU, going on to ventilation or dying from COVID. So the evidence is broad, it's consistent. Um, right. And then when you adjust it for all the various factors that travels with higher weight, there seems to be an independent association between higher BMI and higher risks. And, and is why is that? Is, is it the immune system or do we know what well, the... No, that's a very good question. So the evidence I think is robust. It's very strongly suggested that obesity is causing worse outcomes over and above other risk factors. Because one of the things might be that people who are more overweight, might maybe it's their composition of their diet or maybe they're not physically active enough that those are the factors and obesity is a, is a risk factor, you know, is a marking adverse lifestyle. But it appears it's as if it is, there's also an effect of having too much weight per se on COVID risk. So why is it? Well, we, all, we know already that some of the ways that the virus is affecting or increasing the risk is, for example, in certain people, you get what's known as a hyperimmune response, is that the body goes into overdrive. It, it almost makes too many uh, proteins that try to target the virus, that or, and those proteins then lead to lots of body changes that makes the blood thicker. Right. Normally, that's normally that's you know if I get hit by a bus tomorrow and I'm bleeding everywhere, making my blood thicker is normally trying to protect me by stopping blood bleeding. But this is exaggerated blood thickness. So right. if you if you end up with this hyperimmune response and you've already got risk factors that lead to a thicker blood to begin with. 
then you may get into trouble. And guess right. what? Obesity, obesity increases blood thickness to begin with. Equally, clearly, COVID is affecting your breathing. So if you go in to get an infection and you've already got an, an impairment in your ability for your lungs to, to take in oxygen, then your, your capacity to buffer against the COVID harms and the COVID effects on breathing are diminished. And guess what? With age and with obesity, particularly people who are more overweight, their breathing ability or their ability to draw in oxygen into lungs is more rapidly diminished with obesity. Okay. I mean, yeah. uh, the same way that if, you know, when you become really unwell, how you deliver nutrients to the body, to different organs, to fight infection really matters. And if you have diabetes or even if you've got, you know, obesity, your ability to deliver sugars and fats to the right places is diminished. You're less efficient at doing that. And that's a problem. And in the same way, obesity might also affect the ability of the heart to pump blood around the body, the kidneys to, to extract, um, you know, to, to, to help extract um, toxins out of the body. All these things are affected by obesity. And we know that from a, a, re, a whole host of research in the way that obesity affects kidney function, lung function, heart function, um, blood thickness, immune function. So, in a sense, being more overweight or obese just rat potentially diminishes your buffering capacity against all the harms that COVID does. So, in a right. sense, you're closer towards having something really bad happening when you know you're closer to that threshold to begin with, as it were. Fine. Yeah. And then obesity itself. So, um, is it genetic or or not? That's a, that's a brilliant question, Lewis. And I think one of the things we really must say is that we mustn't shame people about this. I think I think this this association of obesity to COVID nineteen has set a, a new light on on the adverse effects of obesity. We've always known obesity affects many diseases like diabetes. You know, over the last ten years, cancer risk, heart disease. We've started to understand about heart failure. We now know that actually affects risk of certain conditions like um, skin conditions, like psoriasis, uh, right. breathing conditions, you know, and so on and so on. But those are, many of those things are long-term conditions. COVID, of course, has brought this yeah. to many people's minds in a way that, wait a second, this is really important. I, this is giving me a job. I want, I don't want to be a beast anymore. I want to be able to, you know, improve my health. But for many people, it's really hard. So the thing that makes it the hardest is the environment potentiates obesity i.e. there's too much calories in society, they're yeah. very cheap, they're easy to get, there's too easy to not engage in physical activity in the way that we did 30, 40, 50 years ago, there's more you know, cars, and so on and so on. Yeah. And, and actually, we've traveled in the UK, I think we've traveled along that in, you know, worsening environment, obesogenic environment, the many countries, which is why we've got more obesity in this country. That's not to say that there isn't individual changes that people can make but certainly one of the big changes what we in, in the sense we've got to have and we said this and, and and the public health england report said this really nicely that there's there is a need unless there is a deep meaningful and sustained intervention to reduce the drivers on excess calorie intakes and the low levels of physical activity the, imp the impact on health is likely to worsen i.e we have to improve the food environment we have to improve the, the physical environment so that many people without much conscious effort are eating less calories and better con better content and without much conscious effort are being more physically active that's what we have to do 100 percent, 100 percent. i mean i yeah i mean i completely agree the problem the problem i think is right now and i speak to a bunch of different people from different backgrounds and stuff i think the education isn't there like not all calories are made the same for example you know like eating eating fresh food versus canned stuff going to mcdonald's going to kfc whatever like you know, I think, and certainly, you know, you hear a lot in um, like fast food, they say is cheaper, right? Like you can get, you can feed your family at McDonald's, uh, especially with the government's 50% uh, off Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, yeah, for like yeah. three, three quid, right? You can get a Big Mac for 80p, times that by four, some chips and, you know, but, but you can, you know, you can eat healthy on a budget, but it's just, you know, it doesn't feel like it's taught at school. 
Um, yeah. it, it doesn't filter through. And, you know, there's an awful lot of people who are, you know, finding finding life pretty tough. Um, you know, more and more people are losing their jobs right now. And so, yeah. I mean, I know Boris has just has just started this obesity campaign. I'm, I'm not sure he's quite nailed it yet, but I just think it needs to be like some re real education. And I mean, remember Jamie Oliver did the, the healthy school meals thing um, like, like, probably years ago now. But yeah. there's just it doesn't feel like there's been as much stuff recently on that. It's not been talked about as much. And I think it just you have to talk about it now, whether you want to talk about it or not. You just got to you got to improve your health, and and that comes from good eating and exercise and and sleep. Absolutely, absolutely. No, no, you're right about sleep as well. I mean, the, if if you ask, let me. I think there's a number of layered things that you've said there, Lewis, which are really important. Um, you know, if you ask many people who are overweight or obese, particularly in the obese category, would they want to be lighter and leaner? The answer is yes, they would love to be. Um, would, if you ask many of them, does it affect their quality of life? And the answer is yes, it does in a bad way. So improving weight would be good. They would rather they never got to that stage. They would rather they stayed lean. Um, but and, they, and many of them have tried to lose weight, but they can't. They just don't know what to do. And as you say, there's so many temptations of cheap calories out there that they find it difficult to resist. Um, I think... You know, and many of people who are experts in the area absolutely realize that w one of the things that we need to change is the is the food environment. So that when somebody goes shopping, there are far less unhealthy options which are cheap, and there are far better healthier options which are cheap. And it's changing yeah. that dynamic. Now, the food industry can make healthier choices which are cheaper, but they will have to take a hit on their profits. They still have to be, remain profitable for them to be you know interested in making them, but. Yeah. The reality is the food industry for years have been making big profits, increasingly so because sugar and fat have been cheap. They put it into lots of foods. Sugar and, sugar and fat, you know, taste nice and salt tastes nice. And people have been buying it, lots of cheap stuff, consuming it. And the food industry made more and more profits. But they now need to take a hit so that yeah. they have better quality foods. And they can do it. They've got, they've got the intelligence to do it. And uh, uh, but they need to just take a slight hit in the profits. But the reality is, if they work with us, the government uh, and community, the food industry can be part of the solution. But you know, the problem is, and you're, you're completely right. But I just the, the education. It's like you know, like you say to people, um, you know, people think eating fat is bad, for example, right? Or or you eat fats, I don't know, like a nice avocado with some good fats in there you think you're going to get fat, right? It's, it's the processed carbs and the sugars, you know, the combination of the two, you're going to store, store fat. And, and look at that classic American diet. You know, people have been eating that for years and only recently have people started to realize actually probably not the way to go. It's, it's also, it's also a complete, um, it's a minefield like the eating well. I mean, you really have to like do a lot of research to work out what you should yeah. eat um you know well, talking about companies it's actually like i think it's you know making your own food is the best like fresh produce but it's hard to do it takes time yeah it does. Well, yes or no i mean let me give, give you some simple examples for the listeners actually so the yeah. best evidence state based on terms of what you know foods are linked to obesity it's if i was to put it in in a nutshell it's it's probably high dense calories yeah and so the low-hanging fruits of what improve, you, people can improve is certainly cut out refined sugar, yeah. um, but but in terms of calories, you know, is it the type of calories? In part it is, but it's actually total calorie intake that matters. You, okay. Lots of people are getting that from too much fat, and, and most people who are getting you know becoming overweight are also eating too much refined sugar and carbohydrate. They're often linked. Yeah. So, for example, if I now go down and says I'm hungry, and I go and have myself a biscuit. Lots of biscuits have lots of fat, you know, saturated fat, but they also have lots of sugar. So it's yeah. a combination of things. Crisps, lots of excess fat. Pizzas, excess carb and fat and cheese. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'm not saying these things are bad individually. We all need sugar. We all need fat. We all need protein. Now, you made it correct. The, 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 diff, the, the choices in the following, and I, the way I could probably best explain it is the kind of the change in diet that I had to affect because I've, I've got a family history of diabetes. So when I was 20, I was a bit heavier, but maybe one or two stone. I soon discovered I had a family history of diabetes. At that time, I was drinking sugary drinks. I was having 
I, uh, I, I, I'll tell you what it was. I was having Frosties every day with my breakfast. <laughs> Yeah. I was having chips at the school, at the hospital canteen every day and eating, you know, plenty of crisps. Gradually over time, I've changed that and I've retrained my palate. I've cut out my sugar in my tea. I no longer have sugary drinks. I very, very rarely. I have diet drinks of water. I've got used to eating a fiber-rich cereal. I love shredded wheat, would you believe now? I add a bit of fruit on it. My palate yeah. has adapted slowly to enjoy that, and I really love it now. Yeah. I very rarely have crisp. My average intake at, at breakfast is shredded wheat and, and some and brown bread with you know toast. At lunchtime, I'll have soups or salad or, or, a, or a sandwich. And I try and avoid the dense calories. You know, tuna, egg main is fine with a bit of salad. We have a salad at every meal at evening. And I've got used to eating salads, cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers. Again, I had to retrain my palate to enjoy those. I've, en I've got to... Now start eating fruit every day instead of having. But having said all of that, I still have occasional pizza. I still have occasional curry. I still have yeah. occasional crisps, but they become less frequent. And my more often is that I'm having foods that are less dense, more fiber rich, yeah, less calorie dense, and I enjoy them as much as I enjoy the previous food. But the, but but they're because they're less calorie dense. They're filling me up. I lost initially a couple of stone and I've stayed the same weight for 25 years. Brilliant. And I've, I've increased my physical activity that I enjoy. We've got a dog as well that, you know, she really helps. So those th yeah. yeah. So I ideally would like people to get that early on before they become overweight or obese. Because yeah. it's easier it's easier to make lifestyle changes when you're not overweight or when you're not obese than it is to become obese and be train and reduce that. It's far Definitely. easier. Yeah. So for, for many people, imagine so, some of those foods I told you about. I'll say, for example, crisps were more expensive. Some of the calorie dense options were more expensive. And some, you know, ideally we want fruit and veg to be less expensive. Yeah. And, and we want a range of healthy options, which food industry can make, the drinks can make. You know, and then as an example would be the sugar tax has led to healthier drinks. Because the sugar industry has got rid of a lot of those things because yes. they didn't want to make, you know, we yes. can do the same with foods. And that yeah. is the direction of travel that we need. It. And the food industry can be part of the solution. They might need to make slightly less profits for a period of time until they make better quality foods. But yeah. we're still going to eat. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. And that, yeah. I think that's the direction of travel we need to have. To have to Definitely. Have. I, I, try and, I try and think of it as like, you know, if it grows in the ground or if it was, if it was living, uh, it's probably healthy. If it's got a, a nutrition label on the back of the pack, you can avoid it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but one of the questions you might ask me, Lewis, and I think you, you were probably, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, how do we, how do, we do that? Is, 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 is what Boris has tried to do enough? The answer is, is it's not, but it's a step in the right direction. I would love yeah. that we had a big label on every food that told you total calorie content so that yeah. people didn't have to go and work it. You know, if you go to most you know, calorie contents, it says per 100 grams is this number of calories. Yeah, you're trying to work it out. And you're trying to work it out. And, it's, it, and they deliberately make it hard so you cannot work out how many calories you're putting in your mouth. Now, say they said, you know, for this, for this uh, chocolate bar, there's 250 calories. Or for this drink, there's 300 calories. And, you, and then... And then you suddenly work out, wait a second, if I have that bar and that you know, drink, I'm having 500 calories, which is roughly a quarter of my intake. And you know, and, and if you're told roughly that an average you know, meal at nighttime is about 800, 800 calories, you're thinking, my God, that's close to a full meal. It Maybe does. I'll just have a cup of tea and a banana, which, which is 90 calories, <laughs> as an example. Yeah, yeah. Well, it would be great to see. A lot of people are using these apps now. You know, on your phone, so you can you can yeah. keep track of your calories. It'd be good to see little QR codes on 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 the back of some uh, of some video. You can slap, you know, you can uh, scan the codes and and tot it up. And I, I went through a little bit of using the apps. It's it's it takes a bit of uh, of discipline, you know, yeah, to, to keep. This is the thing. Like I went through a a few phases of you know tracking my macros, what what nutrients I've been having, how much fat, protein, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I just couldn't keep it up. For, for a sustained yeah, no. period of time it's difficult and and listen and that's really important sustainability is everything you're an intelligent man you tried it you're interested in your health and even you couldn't manage it so it's, it's not going to work out in the community the, the thing about obesity is there is a strong social deprivation gradient 
The thing about COVID, there's a strong social deprivation gradient. What's it likely to worsen? It's likely to worsen obesity levels in the people who are the hardest hit to begin with, yeah. the poorer, the less affluent, the ones who have less ability to look at, you know, to use apps and understand. So that's, again, why we need to actually change the food environment fundamentally so that without much conscious effort, people can eat healthier without having to even think about it is the way that it's going to improve the whole of society. I completely agree. So I mean, yeah. definitely. I mean, look at the plastic bag. You know, they, they charge 1p, no one cares. 2p, mm, you know, suddenly, suddenly, I think they hit 10p. No one takes the plastic bags anymore, you know. So yeah, exactly. You're right. I mean, it really. It, you're right. If it's if it starts from the the, the providers, so that the, the food manufacturers and stuff, the government do their part. Schools do their part. Hopefully, collectively, we can all you know pull together on this. No, you're absolutely correct. And and the same thing is now starting to happen. There's early evidence from from in Scotland from alcohol pricing that as alcohol pricing unit per unit pricing has you know has been put in, uh, some alcohol beverages have gone up in price. And the intake has come down slightly. Right. And there's early evidence for sugar taxing. Intake of sugar beverages have come down in various countries because of it. So it does work. So it's I don't quite remember all of them. It's like it's like the five P's, you know, pricing, packaging, promotions, you yeah. know, pa you know, uh, you know, th those kind of things that really matter. And and that's where we've got to work. And um, ideally again. If we can get the food and drinks industry on our side saying, look, we understand you've got to make a profit, otherwise you're not going to exist. But if you work a little bit hard to make cleverer foods and better quality and better ingredients, put the calorie content down and, you know, the, improve the pricing, you, you can help cut the obesity, you know, problem in the UK, give a, lead to a healthy society and be part of the solution of this, of this pandemic, however long it goes on. And improve the health of future generations. Yeah. And that's what we've got to work towards. And it's got to be, it's got to be, you know, and if they're not going to do it uh, off their own back, it's got, it's got to be enforcement. It's forced, definitely. It's got to be enforced. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you so much, Naveed. It's been great to speak to you. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I'm super excited. Let's work towards that. And I think now, you know, more, as, as more people discuss this hopefully it gets it gets okay to talk about it because some people you know they don't like talking about weight they don't like talking about obesity they're a bit yeah you know cagey on it and stuff so hopefully it just gets a bit more acceptable the conversation starts more and i think it will help everyone no lewis i think and i, I must say I'll, I'll finish on this point you've you've hit the nail on the head we've got to have that conversation we've got to have it in a friendly envir environment we've got to have in a way that actually says to people we're not here to to, to criticize or, 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 or judge you, we want to help you. And that's got to come from uh, society, it's got to come from media, it's got to come from the health profession. And that conversation is really important. We, people want help and we've got to help them. And that's, that's really important. So I completely agree with this. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me. Uh, uh, absolute pleasure. Take care.